Good evening. Can you all hear me? This is a wonderful crowd, and I know you're having a fun time with your conversations. And that's what this is all about, conversations that matter. And I want to welcome you for this evening, and I want to welcome you to the Westmont Downtown Series. My name is Bobby Kinnear, and I'm a member of the Westmont Foundation Board. Um, the Westmont Foundation Board and our Westmont professors welcome all of you. We're really pleased to have you. Um, in preparation for this breakfast, the President's Breakfast that we're having March 6th, we chose this topic. We wanted you to be uh, knowledgeable of this, oh, here it goes, a little louder, knowledgeable about this um, topic. Now, I wanted you to know that at the President's Breakfast on March 6th, which is the first Friday in March, we still have tickets available. They're $125 per person. And the speaker is Doris Kearns Goodwin. Good catch, Mark. Anyway, Doris Kearns Goodwin is a world-renowned presidential historian and a Pulitzer Prize winning author. She has written six critically acclaimed and New York Best Time bestsellers, including her most recent The Bully Pulpit, Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and The Golden Age of Journalism. She will be speaking on leadership lessons <laughs> from American presidents. I wasn't sure if something else was falling over here. So it's very important. You, I hope you all can attend. It is early in the morning. It's 7 o'clock in the morning until 9. And you do have to get up early, but the coffee is very, very, very good. <laughs> now, I do not have the bully pulpit up here, but Dr. Mark Sargent does. So I want to be introducing him. He uh, assumed the role of provost uh, at Westmont College in the spring of 2012. He's a graduate at UCSB and earned his master's degree and doctorate in English at the Claremont Graduate University, specializing in American literature. He's had a long and distinguished career, and uh, he came to Westmont after 16 years, uh, provost at Gordon College. Westmont was not new to his family. His wife graduated from there as one of his sons, and his daughter is a senior there now. So I want you to see and meet, and you've already have, Mark Provost, Dr. Excuse me, Dr. <laughs> Mark Sargent. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to add my welcome to everyone this evening. Good evening. It's great to see such a, a wonderful crowd back there. It's a real pleasure to be with you again today. I'm glad to share this podium or this pulpit. Uh, with two wonderful colleagues from Westmont. Um, as Bonnie mentioned, each winter Westmont Downtown Lecture Series uh, hosts its first uh, lecture of the, uh, of the uh, calendar year on a topic that's relevant to the President's Breakfast, which we will be having on March 6th with Doris Kearns Goodwin. As Bonnie mentioned, she's a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, wrote No Ordinary Time, book on Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, for which she won the Pulitzer. In the last decade, won widespread attention for a book on Abraham Lincoln and his cabinet called Team of Rivals, as well as made the bestseller list of the New York Times for The Bully Pulpit, which is a story of the friendship and the eventual falling out of the relationship between Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. Now, The Bully Pulpit is a hefty work, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> nearly 800 pages in small print. And the fact that a hefty 800-page book, half of which is about William Howard Taft, can become a New York Times bestseller <laughs> tells you at least two things. First, that we tend to be fascinated with the story of our presidents, their lives and their personas. We're intrigued by the ways in which the people of the White House define their times and are defined by them. Uh, and just for curiosity's, curiosity's sake, how many of you have read a presidential biography at some point in your life? Okay, terrific. Second, the point that Doris Kearns Goodwin has had a remarkable career as a popular interpreter of the American presidency. She is a scholar, 
with her team of researchers, uh, who has woven together compelling accounts that portray the way personal lives, professional ambitions, and the possibilities and the pressures of an era can all become entangled. Our two speakers today are going to explore aspects of both dimensions. Dr. Tom Connect, an associate professor of political science, will be exploring our perspectives on the American presidency and the growing fault lines between our expectations and the kind of leadership that is possible. Dr. Rachel Winslow, assistant professor of history, will be discussing the distinctive roles that scholarly and popular historians play in our democracy and how their respective contributions shape the narratives that we tell about leadership in our country. Along the way, I anticipate that we will reflect on the changing dimensions of the presidency itself. For instance, I asked earlier, how many of you had read a presidential biography? Let me refine that question. How many of you have read a biography of a president who served between Lincoln, the subject of Doris Kearns Goodwin's last book, and Theodore Roosevelt, the subject of her current one. J just as a reminder, that list includes Andrew Johnson, Ulysses Grant, Rutherford Hayes, James Garfield, Chester Arthur, Grover Cleveland, Benjamin Harrison, and William McKinley. How many people have read biographies of that? Yeah. I'm, I'm proud of you, that's great. <laughs> what, uh, what Goodwin's new book does is suggest something about the changing contours and the rising significance of the presidency itself at the start of the 20th century. It's a theme that's certainly enhanced by her choice to devote a considerable attention in her book to the rise of investigative journalism and the, the role of the presidency, presidency in an era of greater media scrutiny. Our two scholars today will no doubt share perspectives on how the presidency has been and continues to be evolving. So at this point, I'd like to introduce the two speakers ask that uh, they each share their brief presentations, and then we'll engage in some question and answer time from all of you. And since this is a civic event, I'm happy to say that both of our speakers today are not only very much loved teachers at Westmont, they're also graduates of UCSB, <laughs> as I am, by the way. Uh, the graduate of UCSB, not the best loved thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Tom Connect completed his undergraduate degree at Stanford finished his master's degree and his doctorate at UCSB. Prior to arriving at Westmont in 2009, he taught at the University of Denver. He is an empirical scholar. He's done extensive work on voting patterns and inclinations and pu public opinion and policy. He published a book entitled Paying Attention to Foreign Affairs, How Public Opinion Affects Presidential Decision Making. He's also a former college football player and he's currently at work on a, on a book on the politics of sports. <laughs> Dr. Rachel Winslow is a 20th century U.S. historian whose research and teaching interests include race, family, gender, childhood, and social policy, especially in transnational and interdisciplinary contexts. She will soon release a book from the University of Pennsylvania Press on how international adoption moved from a temporary solution to geopolitical emergencies to a permanent fixture of U.S. child welfare policy. She received her doctorate uh, in history from UCSB, a master's from Cal State University at Sacramento, and a bachelor's in political science from the University of Rochester. Uh, I'm especially pleased to introduce her at this Westmont Downtown uh, event because next fall she will be the, be the director of Westmont's new downtown semester in a program that we're calling the Center for Social Entrepreneurship. So, uh, Tom's going to come first, uh, Rachel will follow, but let's welcome them both at this time, so thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I didn't recognize half those names after Lincoln. Um, they are presidents, right? Yeah. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. The uh, topic is presidential leadership. And my specific focus is on the question of whether leadership is even possible. And before I address that question, uh, I just want to commend uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's book to you. Oops. My Marco Rubio moment there. Um, it's an outstanding book. Um, if you're like me, you probably know a lot uh, about Teddy Roosevelt, but maybe not a whole lot about Taft. And in reading the book, I, I was really struck by how much I came to like and appreciate 
uh, William Howard Taft, a president that I really didn't know a whole lot about. Um, so even though it is uh, a lengthy book, it is a fun and fascinating read. I uh, recommend it to you and her presidential breakfast talk coming up on the 6th. So can presidents lead the American public? I'm going to have a controversial argument and thesis. We'll have time for Q&A at the end, and I expect and welcome some pushback. But my argument is basically presidential leadership of the type that most of us expect really isn't possible today. Nor do I think it has ever been an accurate reflection of history. When I think of a leader, I, I think of the kind of heroic leadership that we expect throughout history. Think of Moses in the Exodus. You think of, um, you know, maybe T.R. charging up San Juan Hill. You think of Patton in World War II. And maybe you think of Joe Montana in that final drive of Super Bowl XXII leading the 49ers to victory. This is the impression of a leader that I have in my mind. I'm not really sure it's an accurate one of what presidents actually do. So, in order to think about presidential leadership, we have to think about what tools or authority or power presidents actually have to lead the American public. Teddy called the White House a bully pulpit. Bully in the sense of the British term meaning good. Pulpit is a way to kind of communicate your ideas to the American public. In modern political science jargon, we call it going public. And Sammy Cornell describes the tactic of going public as a strategy whereby a president promotes himself and his policies in Washington by appealing to the American public for support. So why would presidents go public? Well, the answer is really one of institutional weakness. If you didn't know anything about the functioning of the American government, and you just simply read the Constitution of the United States, you would come to the conclusion that it is Congress that dominates our government, not the American presidency. Congress holds the two main powers that you would want in any kind of polity. They write the laws and they control the purse strings. Congress can govern by itself through the formal powers of the Constitution. It does not need the other two branches. The president, by contrast, is in an institutionally weak position. The president cannot govern on their own. Now, this would be all fine and dandy if we didn't expect so much from our presidents. We expect the presidents to be all things to all people, to act as a king, to do and get their policies through Congress. And so there's a gap between what we as the public expect and what presidents can reasonably deliver. And so the story of the modern presidency has been a continual search for power, a way to bridge a separation of powers in our political system and accomplish your goals and what we expect of them. And there are a lot of different tactics that presidents use to try to do this. Um, one is just by circumventing Congress and acting unilaterally. But the second is going public. So the story works like this. Presidents need the cooperation of Congress to get anything done, but it's very difficult for Barack Obama to convince John Boehner or Mitch McConnell to do what he wants them to do. And so that direct link is severed. Presidents still need to convince Congress, so instead they turn to the American public for support. And if they can change public opinion, then they can change congressional behavior. That's the tactic of going public. And so the $64,000 question is, can presidents change the public's opinion? So that kind of sets up a framework. Um, the second part of the story is, what do we really mean by leadership? Um, and I want to suggest that there are four different types of leaders. And we can think of it as in terms of kind of the size of the following. So how big is the group following the leader? The first kind, and this might be incredibly difficult to read, especially to you in the back, but is the lone wolf leader. This is an ideological leader committed to a vision, and the leader pursues it regardless of whether anybody else follows. The second type is the defender of orthodoxy. This is an ideological leader that's committed, or that leads a small but committed minority of the population. You might think of somebody like Ron Paul, 
or, um, yeah, I guess Ron Paul's a good example. <laughs> There's the facilitator. And this leader capitalizes on trends and articulates a vision. And he helps others go where they want to go anyway, or at least they don't object to going. And the final is the transformative leader. And this leader changes public opinion. And he convinces others to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do. Now, I think the two, first two kind of styles of leadership or types of leaders are pretty easy to understand, but the last two oftentimes get conflated. So I'm going to give you kind of a silly example. Um, it's nearing dinner time. I'm incredibly hungry. I'm sure most of you are as well. And let's say that we're all going to go out to dinner together, and Mark has uh, decided to pick up the tab. Thank you, Mark. Uh, but we're divided on where to go. So some people want to go to Bouchon. Some people want to go to Downey's. And I say, OK, hey, we're all going to Downey's. And you follow me, and we all eat at Downey's. That is a facilitator. You are all hungry. You all want to eat. And I've focused our choice on one particular restaurant. Imagine the transformative leader. You are all hungry. And I stand up before you and say, you're not hungry. And we're not eating. We're going to go bowling. Now, if you follow me and you bowl with me, and you convince yourself that you're not hungry, I am now a transformative leader. You can imagine that that second task is a lot more difficult than the first. We expect presidents to be that latter leader. We expect them to be the transformative leader, and it's too much to ask most of the time. Being a transformative leader is incredibly difficult. First, it is hard to gain the public's attention. Barack Obama probably has more media exposure than any other human in world history. You have cable news coverage. You have, he has a Twitter feed. He has uh, you know, Facebook pages, White House web pages. He, we, we could pull out our smartphone right now and probably figure out what Barack Obama's doing, where he's at, and what he's saying. More coverage than any other person in human history. Yet that same technology that allows incredible media exposure by the president allows us to ignore his comments. So when we go home tonight, my family, who's in the back and I love dearly, um, I'm going to watch the first round of the golf tournament down in Riviera. Um, the kids are probably going to watch SpongeBob SquarePants. My wife's going to get on Pinterest, which I'm not really sure what Pinterest is, but I trust her, and um, that's what she does. So Barack Obama's probably trying to communicate a message to the Connect family that we are going to miss because we are doing other things. Technology allows us to become an inform, uninformed. And so it's a great irony in contemporary politics that there's more media out there, but there's more opportunity to divorce yourself from politics. The second reason is that transformational leadership is really difficult because it's hard to change people's minds. People don't change their minds easily. And so even though Barack Obama has this great platform to communicate his vision to the American public, there are alternative stories and voices out there that are going to tell you that he's wrong. So if he comes out tomorrow and he says the sky is blue, uh, Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh are going to come out and say the sky is red. And so there are alternative messages and alternative frames that are out there. And we are increasingly selecting into media outlets that fit our pre-existing notions of what is right. So if we're liberal, we're tuning into Rachel Maddow and MSNBC. If we're conservative, we're tuning into Fox. And it just simply reinforces what we already know about politics. It makes the job of going public and using the bully pulpit incredibly difficult because you end up only preaching to the choir. So I'm going to be pretty brief here, but I want to cover four different case studies on these different types of leaders. The lone wolf. Oops. I think Jimmy Carter uh, is a good example of a lone wolf president when it came to the Panama Canal Treaty. Back in the 70s, Carter thought that um, American control of the Panama Canal was a flashpoint of anti-American sentiment in the region. And he wanted to give control of the canal back to the Panamanians. It was a policy widely um, 
hated by the American public. Almost 80% of the American public thought that the United States should retain control of the canal, but Carter thought it was best that we give it back, and he did so. And so here's an example of a leader having a vision for the country, and regardless of whether anybody follows, he's going to kind of push forth. And I think we can also consider whether, it, are you a leader if nobody follows? <laughs> the defender of orthodoxy. Um, Obama and the Affordable Care Act, I think, is a good example of this. Um, President Obama tried to transform public opinion, made a lot of speeches when it came to the Affordable Care Act, his signature piece of legislation. But if we can see here in the graph, he really doesn't change people's opinions in the aggregate much, if at all. In fact, the more he talks about the Affordable Care Act, the more unfavorable people see the, the act. Um, so, doesn't do a great job at going public, using the bully pulpit to convince the American public, but he does convince fellow partisans. Democrats love the Affordable Care Act, Republicans equally hate it, and independents are kind of so-so on it. So here is a president that, unable to convince most of the American public, simply pursues a partisan strategy to push through his signature piece of legislation. The facilitator. As I was reading Doris Kearns Goodwin's book on Teddy, I was struck by how much he was a facilitator as a leader. He gets credit for all those great progressive era policies that emerge in the era. He's the trust buster, regulation of uh, food and drug and the railroads, and all those things that we kind of credit him. Goodwin points out that the groundwork was laid by investigative journalists, that the public tide was moving in a progressive fashion, and that Roosevelt, in many ways, was kind of the beneficiary of a tide in public opinion and articulated a, a vision. So it wasn't like he single-handedly pushed all these things through, but he rather capitalized on a growing trend in the American public. The transformative leader. Um, I don't know. I've racked my brain to try to come up with an example, and I cannot come up with one great example of a transformative leader in the history of the American presidency. Um, pardon? Um, well, I, I want you to think about that. So I want you to think about FDR, especially the entry into World War II in dealing with the Depression. Does he transform public opinion, or does he ride a tide that exists. So we're going to have Q&A at the end. Um, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this. But um, yeah, so my conclusion is that we ought not expect our presidents to be transformational leaders. It's expecting way too much. Because we have these unrealistic, unrealistic expectations of them, there's been a long-term decline in the approval of presidents. We expect them to be these great transformative leaders, and when they're not, we're inevitably disappointed. And I think in many ways, Barack Obama is a great case study in this. Wins the election in 2008, and people are really excited. They see this as a new era. Six years later, a lot of people are incredibly disappointed because it hasn't panned out the way they thought it might pan out. Um, and I think the problem is not so much Barack Obama, just that we expect way too much of our American presidents. So, thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Tom, for those insights. Um, I'm excited to hear the discussion afterwards, so I will do my best to keep this enthusiastic and brief. Um, our topic today encourages us to reflect on U.S. presidential leadership and how historians like Doris Kearns Goodwin um, shape our understanding of presidents. And I hope to help us think about this today by considering historical approaches and debates between popular and academic history. That sounds dry, but I promise it won't be. Okay, so here's a story for you. When I was in college, the summer of 1996, I worked as a sales associate at Barnes & Noble. As a history major, the manager put me in charge of the store's history section. 
And incidentally, I was also a political science major, but it turns out the politics section was much more popular and already covered. So take from that what you will. I don't know. But I had visions of this history section leader role requiring intellectually rigorous work but it really was more about cleaning up lattes that got spilled in the aisle of my section. <laughs> However, custodial duties aside, I was also responsible for keeping the section organized, which meant that I alphabetized, straightened, and did occasional merchandising. So when you're stocked on, overstocked on certain items, we would face out the covers of books to display those items so you could see the covers, kind of like that. My manager insisted that this helped to sell books. And so um, I'm not sure if that's true. I suppose it would come down to whether you believe um, a book is judged by its cover. But that aside, um, it did give me a kind of an economic motivation to spend a lot of time organizing the history section that summer and facing books out and constantly trying to reorganize my section. Um, and as I did that, I started to realize what kinds of history were sold. You might expect that as a history major, the section's contents were quite familiar to me. And it's true that I did recognize an occasional book or two from my undergraduate courses. French historian uh, Ferdinand Braudel's two-volume masterpiece on the Mediterranean world was one of them, if any of you have read this. Uh, he's a noted social historian that came up a lot in my Western Civ classes. The section also had books by famed US historians of the 1950s and 60s, Richard Hofstetter, Arthur Schlesinger, but most of the titles that I read in school were not available at the Barnes & Noble. There were no works by the legendary cultural historian Roland Marchand or Herbert Gutmann, who was a preeminent historian on the black family from the 1970s, or even Gordon S. Wood's pathbreaking work on the American Revolution. Instead, the shelves were full of books by people named Barbara Tuckman and Stephen Ambrose and David McCullough. I remember being distinctly confused by the lack of overlap. Why were my history professors assigning completely different books than the ones that the Barnes and Noble was carrying? How had I never heard of these historians who had made wonderful contributions and won all kinds of awards? Was college history different from bookstore history? It was in this context that I heard my, had my first encounter with Doris Kearns Goodwin. Boxes and boxes, I kid you not, of her books, No Ordinary Time, showed up in the stockroom of our Barnes & Noble. She had just won the Pulitzer Prize for her parallel biography on the lives of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. And as you can see here, the cover on the left was the one that she came out with in 1994. By the time I was done with working at Barnes & Noble, the cover on, the, on your right was the one we were stocking. You might say that No Ordinary Time was my gateway book into what some have called popular history. When I read the story of the Roosevelt, it took me back to my childhood as a little girl who was obsessed with presidents. I would sit on the floor of the family room of my house with the world book encyclopedias scattered all around me. Yes, physical copies of encyclopedias, which would astound my students that they existed, but they did. Um, and I would read for the 10th time the story of Dolly Madison saving George Washington's portrait from the White House during the War of 1812, and, the, and this president named James Monroe, who had reimagined US power in the Western Hemisphere through the Monroe Doctrine, or about the little boy with polio who would become president over great physical odds. I not only wanted to read about presidents while they were in office, but I wanted to understand how they got there. It was Goodwin's book that took me back to this earlier moment and reminded me of why I had started liking history in the first place. I'll confess to you um, here, it's because I'm a sucker for a good story. I have loved how the narrative drove her, her representation of the past. And through the narrative, the astute reader could see political and social and economic changes. Even through exceptional visionaries and leaders like FDR, I could appreciate the story of his life and what it meant about sweeping US foreign policy at the time when the US was moving from isolationist to interventionist even before World War II, while also hearing the lives of people like Franklin and Eleanor. So what they read 
who they befriended, what their marriage was like. Her work certainly contained analysis and argument, but what I most remembered was how this 10-year-old California girl felt connected to these early 20th century New York blue bloods. I felt like I knew them. Inadvertently, Goodwin's work also introduced me to the sometimes divergent worlds of academic history and popular history, especially when it concerns the, the subjects of biography, of politics, and of war. I'll be honest with you, I'm a little skeptical of this tendency to stick academic history in one corner, popular history in the other, the two at war with each other never to meet. It's this type of thinking that leads us to a series of overgeneralizations, most of which are downright incorrect. The overgeneralizations go like this. Popular histories are narrative, academic histories are analysis. It's not true. Popular histories often contain analysis, and I have read some pretty dang impressive narratively driven academic histories. The second overgeneralization, popular histories are readable, academic histories are incomprehensibly jargon filled. <laughs> In general, no disrespect to the political science department here, I think historians produce some of the most readable works among academics, and I think have demonstrated their ability to communicate and write a very clear line of prose. The third overgeneralization, popular histories are written by journalists and academic histories by scholars. Again, not so. Goodwin has a PhD in American government. Stephen Ambrose, PhD in history, um, very famous author, Undaunt Undaunted Courage, Band of Brothers, and served as a professor for most of his career in Louisiana. <coughs> the final one, popular histories have a sweeping scope and academic histories are much narrower. I think that is actually sometimes the case, but recent works in the field have suggested that people are pushing past that to write more historical syntheses and to consider broader sweeps of time. What I think tends to be a better way to understand the differences between popular and academic history is one that historian David Greenberg pointed out in a piece that he wrote for the online magazine Slate several years ago. And his article, which was titled That Barnes and Noble Dream, I kid you not given my opening illustration here, um, explored the differences in these types of histories. And he comes to the conclusion that what actually differentiates academic history from public and popular history is not the end product, but instead what drives the author to write in the first place. Graduate students, professors, and scholars are most often motivated to produce books that engage with current debates or questions in the historical field. Their works are designed to build on existing histories. And because of that, these books acknowledge what has come in before in how they pose questions, how they examine the research, and how they shape their arguments. Historians for the masses are not driven by these same goals. It doesn't have to be unusual, new, or reflect current historical debates. Just to prove my point, think about biographies on Abraham Lincoln or the JFK assassination. The more works on the subject, the better. And that's because these writers want not only to examine the past, but they also want to sell books by writing things that people want to read about. The beauty of popular histories is that they offer an entrance point into the past. Works such as Goodwin's have the power to make people relate deeply to a historical figure without the context requirements of much academic history. To enjoy the bully pulpit, you don't need to have previously read about the details of progressive era reform. You don't need to know the ins and outs of muckraking journalism or understand scholarly debates over eugenics or racial fitness narratives. You can immerse yourself into the turn of the century America without extensive background because Goodwin provides you with the basics to enjoy the story, even if it does take her 750 pages. <laughs> Although popular histories tend to provide these in-depth examinations of an individual life or two, they can de-emphasize, however, the importance of context and social forces. To focus on one person's perspective often means that other stories necessarily become secondary or even skewed. They're only told as it influences the main character or the protagonist. At times, popular histories can rely too much on individual explanations as well for social change. We need academic historians to 
spend the years that it sometimes takes to uncover new interpretations of existing material, to grapple with new frameworks and arguments, to build off of an emerging historical idea, or come up with something entirely revolutionary. This type of work is crucial to seeing the larger forces and movements that counter, the pa that can contour the past. Okay, so what does all of this detail on historical approach have to do with the American presidency? I know you are wondering. So I will say that it is the way that historians choose to depict presidents that deeply affects how we remember and commemorate them. You know about presidents because someone told you about them. And so whether that's oral or written or visual, that is how you know. And so because of those perceptions, they're deeply influential in the ways that we both view the office of the presidency itself and the way we assess our current president. By giving so much personal life detail, popular histories often do a good job of helping us relate to presidents as people. This ability to relate can make us more engaged and interested about learning more but we also need to understand the role that broader social and cultural and political forces play in their leadership. Popular history tends to render presidents as fundamentally individual personalities or forces of nature and can downplay the broader systemic realities. Next week, my lower division history survey course will begin discussing the progressive era and the influence of Theodore Roosevelt on the expansion of presidential power, among other things. I'm going to call him TR. That's how I refer to him usually to my students. TR is the first president to invite and dine with an African American in the White House. Goodwin explains that when TR invited Booker T. Washington, the noted black educator, to the White House in 1903, it was evidence of his racial progress. We learn that Roosevelt was stunned and saddened by the vehement opposition from Southern lawmakers who couldn't abide someone like Washington occupying the same space as white men. Because Goodwin has spent hundreds of pages at this point in the book detailing TR's life, the reader relates to his plight, and they believe, he want to believe he is that racial progressive. But when you broaden the lens to focus on what is happening around Roosevelt's pre pre presidency, as academic historians have done, it tells us a much more complicated story. TR likes the symbolism of bringing Booker T. Washington to the White House in 1903, but he does nothing from a policy perspective or political perspective to address Jim Crow segregation in the South. Indeed, when TR later runs on the Bull Moose Party platform, he says he does not want to support African American equality because he fears losing Southern votes. And more than that, there, if we stand back and even ask who he invited, an invitation to someone like Booker T. Washington as opposed to someone like W.E.B. Du Bois is very telling. Arguably, scholars have traditionally seen Washington as an accommodationist, one interested in accepting social and cultural segregation so as not to upset the status quo. Instead of resisting oppression, Washington urged blacks to become indispensable to the southern economy, which would make whites depend on blacks and then lead eventually to racial harmony. Of all the Afri African Americans to bring to the White House, Washington was perhaps the least controversial for white people, but was perhaps the most controversial for African Americans. I think it depends on the point of view. When this context is added to Roosevelt's story, we get a much more nuanced version of what this White House visit signified and the realities of racial discrimination in the 20th, 20th century. As an educator, I want students to grapple with the complexities and nuances of great leaders. In my experience, they are much more willing to engage deeply with these ideas if they can relate to their subjects. It is indeed a worthwhile endeavor to have our presidential histories not only complicate our impressions of American presidents, but to also inspire us to want to learn more about them. Thank you.
Rachel, you talk well about uh, the attraction to biography as an entree into their lives. So it's a question for, bo for both of you. Y do you think that fascination with approaching our history through the individual lives and that the desire for inspiration by telling the stories is actually contributing to what Tom is talking about as an inflated sense of expectation about what an individual person can do in the role? It's for both of you, yeah. yeah. Is this, this is on? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I do think that that is an amazing entree into thinking about, and just maybe puffing up our understanding of leaders. I mean, I think we expect a lot of our leaders. I think when we, when we actually hear real stories about them, I wonder, though, if it counters the tendency to believe that they are more exceptional um, than we would think they are. And I say that because as you're reading through the bully pulpit's a great example. I mean, there's some really uncomfortable, embarrassing real life things that happen to both Taft and TR, to their families. And I keep thinking that that humanizing is actually a really important social work to be able to say, um, this person is just like you. They struggle with some of the same things that you do, and in some ways, maybe that makes them even more relatable. I'm not sure. <coughs> I, as a political scientist, I actually think presidential biographies are more interesting precisely because they cover that human element. I, I just think it's a fascinating story. Um, I don't know if this is on. Can you guys hear me in the back? Mm -hmm. can, can, can you hear me in the back? No. No, there we go. All right. Um, one of the big debates in political science is um, whether great presidents are great because they are great individuals or are great presidents great because of the context in which they occupy the office. Um, so in my own research, I tend to be an individualist. I think people um, basically behave as they're incentivized or coerced to behave, and our greatest presence just simply took office during the time that was right um, to kind of exercise exceptional leadership. Um, so I think it's interesting when we talk about presidential biographies, I think that they're more interesting than the political science, um, but if you were going to ask me what makes a president great, I would basically say the context in which they become president. We have some questions here. Yes, right here. Where would you place Ronald Reagan as president? The question is, where would you place Ronald Reagan as a president? You go. Um, uh, right after Carter, and then <laughs> right before. Is that right? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, where would I place Reagan as a president? I, I think one of the um, one of the interesting stories about Reagan, you know, all the kind of the mythology about Reagan, about the great communicator and, and kind of a fundamental um, transformative president. I think he was a transformative president. Um, but in some of the research on how can presidents move public opinion, Reagan is kind of a central focus, and he, the story is in most of the stuff that Reagan doesn't move public opinion much public opinion moved prior to him becoming president, that the country was moving in a conservative direction, maybe in kind of response to the Carter presidency, maybe kind of dissatisfaction with the Great Society legislation and the New Deal uh, legislation, and that Reagan capitalized on a conservative trend in public opinion. And in fact, um, when it came to his specific policies that he tried to communicate with the public, uh, he oftentimes failed. He failed to convince the American public that we should take a more active role in Central America. He failed com to convince most of the American public uh, about his tax cut policies. Um, it just so happened, though, that the country had already moved in a conservative direction, and I think that was a lot of, of Reagan's success. The big question is, you know, how much does his rhetoric really matter in his overall presidency? In, in a, a lot of scholars just can't find a whole lot of evidence that it mattered that much. I'll, I'll give a quick summary. The, just asking about familiarity with the book, Recarving Mount Rushmore, which argues that we tend to um, glamorize the wartime presidents at the expense of uh, presidents with other skills. <laughs>
Well, and I would, I'm going to stand up so people in the back can see. But I, I would say that um, there is an expansion of presidential power during wartime, and so we tend to remember those presidents because they, in fact, can do a lot more. I mean, as Tom was talking about earlier, presidents are really constrained in what they can do. We see huge expansions of executive power during wartime um, with, under Lincoln, under FDR, um, and under all throughout the Cold War, actually. Uh, we see that a lot. So I would say that to that point, that would make sense to me. I think the metric that we're always holding presidents against, um, often, frankly, in the 20th century, especially is an economic one. And it really does sort of depend upon the economic climate of the country. And I will say, I mean, when you have a really thriving military industrial complex with lots of jobs, it really does make people feel secure and better about sort of national pride than it does in other times. No, I, I think that's a pretty persuasive thesis. You know, if you look at some of the great presidents, they have um, been president during wartime. So um, I would subscribe to that. Mm -hmm. Good. Qu question relates to whether it's possible to, for presidents to move that needle of public opinion, especially in such a fractured environment that we have today. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think you can move the needle of public opinion much, if at all. Um, and so governing effectively, I, I guess, in, in some ways, requires having majorities in Congress and a supermajority in the Senate. Um, so if you want to pass a lot of legislation, you've got to win elections. Um, and so it's a, uh, it's a difficult task in, in, today's, in today's environment to govern because we are so polarized. So I think that's a... That's great. <coughs> Yeah, a, a question and, and really and a vote for uh, Lyndon Johnson as a transformative <laughs> president. <Yeah. laughs> um, maybe, uh, but I wonder if Lyndon Johnson and the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of 64 and 65 wasn't brought on by Martin Luther King, the Civil Rights Movement, and having, and having super majorities. And so I would say that he facilitated that change. Um, did he bring about the change? I, I wouldn't think so. I, I, I think he capitalized on the trend. And, and so, I, again, I would throw him into the category of a facilitator, um, not a transformative leader. And that's not to diminish his leadership or any president's leadership. I actually think being a, a good facilitator is, is uh, admirable and heroic. It's just different than what at least my expectation of kind of the ideal heroic leader would look like. And by the way, it, it, Rachel wants to speak, but there was another question about FDR. Was FDR a transformative leader? And um, I think that's probably maybe one of the closest to a transformative leader, but let's just take World War II. FDR wanted to enter World War II long before we did, and it took Pearl Harbor as a catalyst to move us out of that isolationist mode. And so even in an issue like um, getting into World War II, I think presidents still act as a facilitator rather than transformative leader. And this points to a really interesting question about how change happens. And I think, um, thinking about LBJ, who is, of course, the consummate politician. I mean, you just don't get better than a man who forwardly leans his body in to the people he is trying to persuade, right? I mean, he is absolutely in your space trying to make you change your mind. And yet, and yet, um, we reference social movements because so much of our ideas and political change are, are really outside of office. They are not necessarily in top-down kinds of realities, right? They are in ways that kind of affect the bottom, which is why historians, after watching all of these changes in the 1960s, sat back and said, hmm, maybe we're looking at history the wrong way. Maybe we should start considering what individual people are doing and social movements are doing to change what we consider sort of over overall political and economic structures and realities. And I think that that's one of the stepping back lens pieces from a, a biography that is helpful. Good. Yeah, it's, uh, qu yeah, the qu question relates to whether or not uh, we're judging transformative leaders by whether or not the transformation takes place in the relatively uh, near future as compared to long-term change. I, I think that's a really good point, and, and I would concede that point, that maybe the change happens um, by articulating a new vision for the country that's not fully realized till down the road. Um, so I, I, I certainly agree with you on that. Um, 
Where I think that transformational leadership is difficult is in the use of the bully pulpit and going public to try to change opinion to get a policy passed as you are currently a president. And that, I think, is incredibly difficult to do. And we can find only rare instances where um, it does seem to be effective. But the, again, the myth has been built up that the bully pulpit really shapes the public's opinion. Um, but I, I think that's a, that's a really good point to make, that maybe this happens after a president leaves office. Right. Yeah, the, the question is uh, whether or not our founding leaders would have actually expected the presidency not to be transformative. Yeah. Um, I think the founders would be shocked by what they see. Um, what we see is a very powerful president, um, a president that, and by the way, I don't mean necessarily just our current president, but all modern presidents have taken steps to accomplish their agenda in ways that I would argue that the founders never intended. Um, and part of this is just simply that scramble to fulfill our expectations of what the presidency can be. And so um, Congress played the dominant role at the founding. The founders were certain that they wanted Congress to dominate our governmental system. You just look at the, the order of the Constitution. Article I, Congress. Article II, the presidency. Nobody knew what to do with the courts. That's Article Three. You look at the layout of Washington, D.C. Congress on a hill. Everything else radiates from that. White House kind of thrown off on Pennsylvania Avenue. That's not by mistake. And so in an era um, now that the focus seems to be predominantly on Congress, I think the founders would be, um, well, not all of them, but I, I think some of them would be rather miffed. The question relates to whether or not transformational presidency is really a matter of just your opinion about the presidents. Yeah. Well, I think in some ways, I mean, this isn't my thesis, so I'm taking a lot of liberties here and talking about this, but... Um, <laughs> Thanks. Um, but in some ways, let me just say that I think, um, I think much of what we know is through our remembrance and our memory and the way that we reconstruct those memories. So I, as a historian who has worked with historians who do public history and collective memory projects, we can think back and think about the way that history happened, maybe in our sort of 19th century von Ranke kind of way, just as it was, which of course is one person's take on how it happened. Um, or we can take a look at it and understand that we remember things a certain way to fulfill particular understandings of the world or the way that we choose to see the world. That is, William Faulkner says, that the past is not even past, right? That we're constantly dealing with our past. So I would say that often I think when we think and we talk about presidents, we talk about them with all of our modern understandings of what we would like them to do and in doing that we sometimes do this funny thing I call I tell my students it's called folding history where we p take one part of history and we move it to the next part and forget the 80 years we just folded completely over um, that change over time exists and it happens and we expect different things at different times for really legitimately good and different reasons so yeah I, I actually agree with part of the question that when we look at presidential greatness, it's difficult to divorce ourselves from our own personal opinion about what the president ought to do and kind of the policies. So I, I agree with that. Um, but I'm an empiricist. I look at data. Um, and some of the points that I want to make, that the president can't move public opinion that much, um, that this kind of transformational leadership is borne out in empirical data that has no normative content. That I just can't find much evidence that going public has a discernible effect on the opinions of the average American. Which leads me to believe that that kind of idea of transformational leadership is incredibly difficult. That presidents can move public opinion only at the margins and only under certain conditions. Now that has nothing to do with my opinion, that's just simply what the data tells me. How much, the question is, how much does religion help or hinder when it's moved into the political arena? I mean, we're already in this politics, and so we're going to throw religion into it. Um, <laughs> we might not get out alive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. um, we're going to start talking about sex next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, <laughs> it's a good question. I, I, I think this is a really good question. Um, Americans want a president that has a certain amount of faith. Um, they seem to be somewhat ambivalent about how much. So uh, you have people kind of cringe when Jimmy Carter said he was a born again Christian and they're kind of like, ah, that's kind of weird. And then, um, you know, but I, I guess Eisenhower um, would definitely wouldn't fit in the necessarily in the evangelical category. Uh, but he found religion when he was on the campaign trail and at least showed up at church. And so... Um, <laughs> Where I think it matters is in the primaries and especially the Republican primary. I think it's um, something that the Republican field has to address, and for a lot of Republican voters, it's a very important thing. In the general election, today's day and age, I, I wonder if the importance of religion isn't decreasing somewhat. I would just say that I think that sometimes our perspectives are... Um, kind of limited when we think about this. I would expect that the black church thinks it has a lot to do with why Obama got elected. Um, and I think that sometimes we think we tend to think of religion um, in the way that it is sort of depicted on Fox News as this very you know one-dimensional understanding of a particular kind of Christianity, but we forget that there's really a diversity of understanding what um, Christian experience and faith looks like. Um, certainly, when JFK is elected, we see the first Catholic because we have this space in the 50s of sort of civic religion where Jews are for the first time welcome into sort of the public. Um, space to be part of the sort of Judeo-Christian value system. And I mean, that's a product of the turn of, you know, second half of the 20th century. So I would just say that, I mean, I think we, we, would, we would do well to pay attention to other kinds of fringe areas. I mean, I would say that it probably really deeply matters to certain Latino communities um, who they're voting for based upon religion. So. That's great. Well, uh, th this I said two questions, but that was two answers. <laughs> two, two good answers. So uh, I want to thank our panelists. Let's thank our two panelists for. Uh, <laughs>